Thank you for joining us for this next in our series, Being Like Jesus. In this case, prayerfulness. When I first started on Nightline, people began ringing and saying, would you please pray for? Would you ask the Nightline family to pray for? It continued for the whole 33 years. I never once asked them to do that. And most of the people had no particular church connection. I guess I shouldn't have been surprised because the 2018 consumer survey based on the census showed that 58.9% of Australians prayed or meditated. That's six in 10. The United States Supreme Court banned prayer in their government schools, but a columnist soon after wrote, the US Supreme Court may try to ban prayer in schools, but they can't ban the silent ones. While ever there are final examinations, there will be prayer in schools. I saw a sign the other day in a toilet that said, prayer changes everything except the toilet paper. That's all you. A huge challenge with this is that it's such a huge topic. I go and visit, we go and visit our family in the United States and we fly over the Pacific Ocean. If you've ever done that, you'll know that you look out the window at about 10,000 meters and see this vast ocean. Then you have a meal and you watch a movie or two. Then you look out the window again. You've been flying for hours at about a thousand kilometers an hour. And it looks exactly the same as it did the first time you looked. Well, prayer is the Pacific Ocean of Scripture. If you take just one translation and the words prayer, worship, praise and give thanks, they occur 865 times. The Gospel Coalition claim that there are 650 separate prayers in the Scriptures. And Dr. Peter Pett, a very uh, respected scholar, says it's impossible to list all the references. So how do we compress the Pacific Ocean of this topic into the eyedropper of time that we have this morning? Well, our senior pastor, Nick Scott, has been very helpful. The text that he's chosen for today is this. Pray continually. 1 Thessalonians 5.17. That's it. Pray continually. So let's have a song and say the benediction and go home. Well, you are home. Now, I think you might have a YBH question here. Pray continually. Yes, but how? Paul did what he tells the Thessalonians and us to do. The word continually is the Greek word adialitos. And he uses that at the start of the letter where he says, We always thank God for you all and continually mention you in our prayers. To the Romans, he says, constantly I remember you. And you may know this series grew from the Lord impressing Paul's prayer in Ephesians 3 on our hearts. And he begins that letter to the Ephesians by saying, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. I keep asking the God of our Lord Jesus Christ and so on. The apostles in the baby church said, we will give ourselves to prayer. We will devote ourselves to prayer. James led the church in Jerusalem. He's described by Hegesippus, a second century historian, as his knees became hard like those of a camel in consequence of his constantly bending them in worship to God. His nickname was Old Camel Knees. Martin Luther said, I have so much business, I cannot get on without spending three hours daily in prayer. John Wesley, I have so much to do that I spend several hours in prayer before I'm able to do it. When Brian Pickering conducted his very helpful school of prayer, he pointed out that prayer is eternal. It's constantly going on. In Revelation, the prayers of the God's people going up before him are mentioned. And he, and he said, in prayer, we become kind of like earthing agents that God is able to pour his power into us and through us for his purposes. No one did that more than George Muller. If you've never checked out his story or read the story of some of the miracles he experienced, I warmly recommend you do so. In fact, he prayed for thousands of hours and saw incredible miracles, everything from a fog miraculously lifting and a sea captain becoming a Christian to drains being unplugged. 
More than anyone else, Jesus prayed continually. The Gospel Coalition says that Scripture records at least 25 different prayers of Jesus. He prayed for the children. He prayed for us in John 17. He prayed for Peter when he was about to deny three times. He prayed for his executioners. The significant events of his life were bathed in prayer. At his baptism, it's as he was praying. At the call of the Twelve, it's after he spent the night praying to God. Transfiguration, when his garments glowed, it was once when Jesus was praying in private. After feeding the 5,000, he went out onto a mountainside to pray. And before he raised Lazarus from the dead, he prayed, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. Now, if you're like me, when you hear things like this, you have two reactions. One is so inspiring and so exciting and you so want to be part of it. And the other is, I give up. I hear about these guys. I'm not in that class. I'm inspired by what God is doing. But then it seems in my life, it's prayer that gets kicked to the curb first in the busyness of each day. Or it just becomes dry, dutiful, rote recitation. Theophan the recluse, you probably never heard of him. He lived in the 1800s, but he had a fantastic image that I find very moving, very accurate today to what happens to us when prayer gets kicked to the curb. He said, we become like a shaving of wood which is curled around its central emptiness. We're frustrated, we're disappointed, we're powerless, we feel discouraged, fearful, anxious and then guilty, and maybe even ashamed. Do you know, it's not just me. I find this almost universal. And that's a pretty good hint that it's not by accident. Luther wrote, If I fail to spend two hours in prayer each morning, the devil gets the victory throughout the day. See, we have an enemy. And the enemy will do all he can to discourage us from intimate time with God. He'll deceive. He'll distract. He'll divert, he'll discourage. And then if he succeeds, he'll pivot around and accuse us. After all, that's his name. He hopes that in our guilt, like Adam and Eve, we'll hide away from God, being even further from the love and blessing that he longs to give us. Now, we don't blame everything on the devil, of course. We're in this as well. And we often begin at the wrong place. Brennan Manning puts it this way, our spirituality often starts with self, not God. Personal responsibility has replaced personal response. So prayer is often seen as us trying to get God's cooperation to gain the desires of our heart. But Jesus saw prayer very differently. He talked about it in the Sermon on the Mount. The world is full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant, full of formulas and programs and advice, peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. Don't fall for that nonsense. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God and you will begin to sense his grace. So prayer is really God attempting to get our cooperation in order to give us the desires of his heart in us and through us, the desires of his heart, as Brian Pickering pointed out. He wants this emptiness to draw us back to him. And that sense of excitement and drawing that is in you when you hear stories of answered prayer and people who walk with Jesus. That's love. See, God is love. And it's the only motivation that never fails. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that. Look at these beautiful children. Simon, Nick, both showed us pictures of their grandchildren. And just to complete the set, so did I. They all related to points that we were making, 
But why did we do that? Well, because we love them. Nick used the word besotted, and we all are. It's no problem for me to fly over the Pacific Ocean to see my grandchildren. When Merle and I FaceTime, thank the Lord for FaceTime, the time flies, it doesn't drag. Jesus was away from home. How did he FaceTime? Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. In the beautiful words of John Greenleaf Whittier's hymn, Jesus knelt to share the silence of eternity interpreted by love. Philip Yancey made this same transition that Jesus talked about when he was walking in the mountains. He says, prayer is not so much me setting out a shopping list of requests for God to consider as it's a way of keeping company with God. I made space for God to pour grace into me and God will come if there is space. Every silent retreat at New Nosia, and we'd love you to join us for one, but every silent retreat, God comes as we make space. He does it in an amazing variety of ways, but in this occasion, on this occasion, I felt drawn to a story from the life of Anthony Bloom. Another guy, if you don't know him, started out as a doctor, became leader of a, a major section of the Orthodox Church. Quite some stunning stuff on prayer. But when he was a young pastor, he began as a doctor, as I said, but early in his pastorate, a lady came up to him and spoke. And this particular little parable, although it's a real happening, so this story has to do with knitting. This elderly lady came up to him and said, for 14 years, I've been asking people who are supposed to know about prayer. Now, since you probably know nothing, you might just bundle, bungle onto the right thing. Hardly encouraging to Anthony. She says, I've been praying the Jesus prayer. That's a very significant prayer for that part of the church. I've been praying the Jesus prayer almost continually. And I've never sensed God's presence at all. Anthony said to her, well, if you're praying all the time, if you're talking all the time, God can't get a word in. Here's what I want you to do. After getting up, getting washed, having your breakfast. I want to make sure that you make sure that there's nothing to worry you. Put your armchair where you can, you won't be distracted and just sit down in your armchair. And first, I want you to really see your room. I think if you've been praying as you described for 14 years, it's a long time since you saw it. Then I want you to take your knitting and knit for 15 minutes before the face of God. I forbid you to say one word. She didn't think that was very pious advice, but she had nothing to lose. She said, I'll give it a try. The very next day she came in saying, it works. And she told Anthony how she first of all sat down and thought, oh, this is wonderful. I have 15 minutes just to sit and I don't have to feel guilty. Then she said, as I looked around, I began to realize what a beautiful room I have. And as I looked at little objects in the room, I began to remember what a wonderful life God has given me. And then I remembered I had to knit. So she started knitting. But she said, I, I became increasingly aware of the silence and the peace. And then the knitting needles hit the arm of the chair. And then she said this, the silence was not simply an absence of noise, it had substance. It was not an absence of something, it was a presence of something. All of a sudden I perceived the silence was a presence. At the heart of the silence, there was he who is all stillness, all peace, all poise. Be still and know that I am God. This lady wasn't studying or discussing that. She was experiencing it. 
You might be thinking, you're good for her, but I feel such a failure. It's so hopeless. Well, see, the lovely thing is, God comes to us where we are. Jesus said to all of his disciples, you didn't choose me. I chose you. Matthew, you were collecting taxes. Guys, you were fishing. If we're being like Jesus, prayerful like he is, what's he doing now? If we're talking about being like Jesus in prayer, what is Jesus doing now? He's praying for you. He always lives to intercede for us at the right hand of God, Hebrews and Romans tells us. And the Holy Spirit, he's praying for you at a depth that is beyond human utterance. The Spirit helps us in our weakness for we don't know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Tony Clark reminded us that God came to Elijah at the last seniors meeting. He was our speaker and spoke about how God came to Elijah when Elijah was praying to die. He came to him where he was and he said, I'm about to pass before you. And if you know the story, there was a wind that split the mountain, burst rock some wind. And then there was an earthquake and then there was a great fire and God was not in any of those. And then there was a gentle whisper. Some of you might know that story as a still, small voice. See, prayer begins with God calling us. And transformation happens from the inside out. You can't spray it on like a fake tan. Jesus said, the one who believes in me, out of their innermost being will flow rivers of living water, flowing from deep within them. As with Elijah, this often begins small. With you, it may begin very small. Unexpected places, unexpected ways. Ezekiel saw the mighty river of God that no one can cross, but it began as a trickle. Who dares despise the day of small things? It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. When Paul prayed continually for the Thessalonians, we find out what he prayed. He said, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling. It begins with God and by his power, bring to fruition your desire for goodness by his power and your every deed prompted by faith. See, the Lord longs for us together to discover how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. But when Paul invites us to jump in, he doesn't just say, now all of you together, get on with it. No, no, he bows his knee like James did. He says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power. He may strengthen you with power to grasp the love of Christ. See, Dan reminded us that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Well, if God never changes and God doesn't play favourites, he doesn't, he's no respecter of persons, then the same access Elijah had and Elisha and Moses and Daniel and David, that same access is available to you. In fact, better is available. Hebrews tells us God had a better plan for us. They were before the cross and the empty tomb. I pray that out of these words of mine today, whatever your disappointment, your emptiness, the challenges, the uncertainties, you'll have that sense of love calling you, of the good shepherd, because he said his sheep would hear his voice. So come just as you are. Jake's recent word in season, he talked about that beautiful hymn and the story of it. Just as I am though tossed about with many conflicts and many doubts, fightings within, fears without, but Lamb of God, I come. Because just as I am, you will receive welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because your promise, I believe, Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am, your love unknown has broken every barrier down. 
now to be yours, yours alone, Lamb of God, I come. By all means, confess. Get rid of what's messing you up. By all means, tell him what's on your heart. But then be still and know that he is God. 